So hello for those of you joining us on uh, YouTube later today. This is a look at another one of the former tests for chapter one, looking at a second example. This is probably the only section which should be going over this particular test with me before they take the exam. Last chance for anybody joining, doesn't look like it, okay. Guess there was a better offer somewhere else. So substances that don't have a fixed chemical formula, uh, they are known of course as mixtures. Sometimes we say solutions, but mixtures is a good enough term as well. Like the air around us with nitrogen, oxygen gas and carbon dioxide. If we're all in a room together, over the course of 50 minutes, the oxygen level would go down a little bit and the carbon dioxide level would go up because of respiration. So changing formula uh, means a mixture or solution. Compounds, elements, molecules always have a fixed chemical formula. Question two, substances that cannot be broken down into simpler uh, chemicals, because that's our elements, that might be a repeat question from the previous practice exam that sometimes crops up and questions sometimes um, come back in after a couple of semesters. Chlorine would be a good example of, well let's again look at our periodic table which I'll put up for everybody during the test today and tomorrow. And we had said that the important thing was to look for boron in the table. That was our entry point because boron is the first of the metalloids. So there we are there with boron. So let's use a thicker pen. No, that's fine actually. And then that diagonal down to the right hit the majority of these metalloids. Uh, the only inclusion or thing to include beyond that would be germanium and antimony, which are also metalloids. And then everything to the right of that divide is a non-metal. The only thing to add to that list is hydrogen, which is also obviously a non-metal. And then everybody else in the table is a metal. So from lithium and beryllium down into the lanthanide and actinide series. Everything else is a metal and the majority of elements in the periodic table are metals. So the question was about chlorine. So there's chlorine there, quite clearly on the non-metal side of the divide. And so that'll be our answer. Question four, fastest moving molecules. Molecules move faster as temperature increases. That rising temperature gives molecules kinetic energy. And so we're looking for the fastest moving, the most random state of matter. That of course is the gas state, whereas solids are the most ordered state of matter. Question five, and there wasn't an example like this in the first exam we looked at, but this is in the notes. So how much water was produced in this reaction? And we touch on this in the notes, it's this idea of conservation of mass. So whatever the total mass going into the reaction is, we should get the same exact total mass coming out. So 64 plus a 16, that gives us a total of 80 grams. Oh, there's someone else trying to get in. Looks like a lot of people's Wi-Fi is spotty because I definitely already added Master Lucas, hello again. 
And so we've got the total mass out, at least for the carbon dioxide. So that 80 minus the 44 means that we must have 36 grams of the water. Thirty six for that one. Total mass in will equal the total mass out. Number five. Now they're still using the same reaction. How much CO2 will be produced if 32 grams of methane is used? Let's take a peek back at the previous one and see how much was previously used. We used 16 grams to make 44 grams of carbon dioxide. So the 32 grams that we're proposing for the methane is twice as much. So it's just like cooking. If you use twice as much of one ingredient, you'd have to use twice as much of the next ingredient and you'd expect to produce twice as much of each of the products. So 44 grams of CO2 becomes 88 grams. Next one. Everything seems straightforward so far. 600 millimeters converted into centimeters. So looking at our scaling for distance conversions, uh, centimeters are 10 times bigger than millimeters. And so if we're starting with the millimeters, trying to go to the centimeter equivalent, it's a factor of 10, starting with a smaller unit, so it's 10 times smaller. So instead of 600 millimeters, we've got 60 centimeters. Let me drag this across so I'm not batting back and forth like watching a game of tennis. So a factor of 10, that's the only one in a conversion, so one of the only ones which does not have a factor of a thousand each time. Other side to that, of course, is from centimeters up to a meter, where it's a factor of a hundred between meters and centimeters. And so that gives us a hundred times 10, a factor of a thousand between millimeters and meters. And most of our conversions are a factor of a thousand at a time. Useful to do the centimeter one, of course, because that's one that appears on your ruler for the metric system. Number eight, 500 milligrams of aspirin converted into micrograms. Again, looking at their conversion scaling. So from milligrams to micrograms, that's a factor of a thousand. And we're starting with the milligram unit, that's the larger unit, to a smaller unit, start with a larger unit, you're going to get a larger answer. So I'm multiplying by a thousand, so that'll be 500,000 milligrams. Number nine, 25 fluid ounces of saline converted into milliliters. I think I mentioned this in the notes. I find that different textbooks give different values for the conversion. And so I just stuck on this nice rounded 29.5 to convert fluid ounces into milliliters. So that gives us a value of, and I peaked and looked at this one earlier, 737.5 milliliters. It's the only one which is even remotely close. That's the only non-metric conversion I expect you to be able to do for volume because we still see fluid ounces used so much in medicine. 10, temperature 40 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, sorry, 40 degrees Celsius, converted into Fahrenheit. 
So we take that 40 degrees Celsius. The first thing we're going to do is multiply it by 1.8, then add on 32. So we're almost doubling it. So that'd be somewhere around maybe 76 or so. Add on the 32, so just a little bit over 100. The 104 is the only one which is even remotely close. I'm making these too easy. I'll have to make the exam extra, extra hard. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, nobody laughs at that joke. Okay. So 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Number 11, the halfway point. Now a patient with a fever at 103 degrees Fahrenheit, which we're converting back into Celsius. So it's the reverse calculation in the reverse order. So now we take away 32 first, and then divide by 1.8 instead of multiplying by 1.8. <laughs> So minus of 32, that would give us about 70, then a little bit more than half, so about 30-ish. So it looks like 39.4 is the right answer. Of course, do it on your calculator just to be super sure, but it's the only one of which is even remotely close there. So 39.4. Number 12. Surgical equipment sterilized at 398 Kelvin. Convert that into Celsius. So we said for the Kelvin temperature, that is always the higher of the two values compared to Celsius, because the coldest temperature on the planet possible, and in the universe for that matter, is minus 273 degrees Celsius. So we subtract that 273, and that gives us, let's see, that'd be a little bit more than 100 less. So 125 degrees is obviously the answer for that one. Next one. Newborn baby weighing 7.7 .7 pounds. Convert into grams. And we said to convert, that would be multiplying by 454 to turn it into the gram equivalent. The four, seven, four. Uh, that'd be the 3400, let me check. Yep, 3,495.8, bingo. Daddy. Hello, yes. Why is you looking at me like that? Why is who looking at you? That's just people's pictures for when they're working with me. Can I do something for you? What do you need? Well, why don't you let me finish, okay, what I'm doing, and I'll let you draw later before lunch, okay? Okay, there's a pen. I'll give you a piece of paper. You want to go into the kitchen and draw? Okay. Can I just give you the piece of paper and let you go at it? Hello? She'll come back for our paper, no doubt. All right, excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, Scooby-Doo must have finished. Let's see. So, C for that one. Number 14. Aha, significant figures. Of course, it always rears its head. Zeros at the beginning are never counted because we might have reached a beyond the maximum capacity for the machine to measure. Zeros in the middle are always counted because there's real data to the left and right. And zeros at the end are only counted if there's a decimal place, which there is tucked in there. So one, two, three, four, five, six significant figures for that one. Is there another? Nope. 
which of the following statements contains an exact number? So a number that we don't have to estimate by I, it's just either one or two, or two or three, etc. A cut above a patient's eye was 44 millimeters long. That would be your estimate by eye using a ruler or something like that. That is not an exact number. 18 stitches, that is an exact number. It wouldn't be 18 and a bit, it's either 18 or 17 or 19. So that is your exact number there. And all the others are estimates. Combined mass of twins, yep. You'd have to estimate that. Patient donating 500 milliliters, you'd have to measure that and look by eye uh, for that volume. So that's an exact number, a discrete number of objects. Number 16, the appropriate answer for. So when we're doing a division, we're looking initially for the least number of significant figures. We don't count the zero at the beginning, so that has three significant figures. And then the number here has five. We do include the zero because there's non-zeros on either side. So that has five significant figures. So the final answer should be three significant figures. The confidence in the final answer is only as good as the minimum level of precision. So 68 divided by the seven, let's see. That looks like the raw answer comes to 9.4881122. Oh, I, you got a piece of paper? Here's a piece of paper. I will clean that up in a second, okay? You don't draw on yourself, draw on the paper, okay? Okay, then then I don't know what book. Oh, she says there's paper in the book. Let me just check what book she's been drawing on. Oh my God. One sec, excuse me. Well, I guess I should be glad it's just a chemistry text and not a copy of my PhD thesis that was sitting right next to it. That was a close call. Anyway, let's see. Right, so three significant figures. There's the cutoff. We're going to Round up, that takes up to 9.49. See, that wasn't the answer I thought I had earlier. Let me check. Okay. Yep, okay, that is the answer. Uh, so that becomes, 9.49. Next one, which is multiplication this time. Everybody still doing okay? So this time we've got three significant figures. 
compared to five significant figures. So again, the answer should be just three significant figures. And let's see, so the 4.20, again, I need my trusty calculator for this. That comes to 20.98782. And we wanted three significant figures. So there's a cutoff. The first number chopped is five or greater, so we round up. That causes a domino effect of rounding up again. So it should be 21.0 to give those three significant figures. There we go. Appropriate answer for 428 minus the 411.03. So switching to addition and subtraction. Now we're looking for the least number of decimal places. First number doesn't have any, zero. Second number has two. So that final answer should have zero decimal places. So the 428 minus 411.03, raw answer comes to 16.97. And so let's see, no decimal places. So that's rounding up. And so 17 should be the final answer. Next one, number, I thought 18 was the next one, no? Okay, sometimes it hops one. Just measuring the volume. So of course, this is using your eye, it's not an exact measurement. And I've got 61 to three milliliters, but it's a little bit more than 63. I would estimate that to be a half. So 63.5 milliliters for that volume. You're always estimating the last significant figure when you're judging it by eye. Even if, let me try and crudely draw something here. Let's see, we've got marking of 65 there and your liquid perfectly comes at 65. Even if it's exactly on a unit, you want to keep estimating the next unit. So you'd estimate that as 65.0. Just because it's sweet on one of the values doesn't mean you don't estimate the last digit. And last one, oops. Number 20, which of these is not an example of a physical property of carbon? So we talked about physical properties as being things primarily like melting points and boiling points, but there was a small list of other examples as well in that. That list also included measuring density, that's a physical property for matter. So was the color or texture. The only one which isn't a physical property is reacting with oxygen to produce CO2. That's a chemical change being enacted there. So that's not a physical change. Physical properties don't change the chemical pro a formula. Physical properties don't change the chemical prop a chemical formula. Okay, any questions before we finish off? So that's all I have to talk about. Of course, we finished the chapter yesterday as we talked about specific gravity and so the test will be tomorrow at 11 a.m or you could take the test tonight at 7 30 or take the test tomorrow night at nine o'clock if you prefer all right let's see dr e a quick question about that test if we if we do Take it tomorrow afternoon. We don't have to let you know. Just the test will automatically be. Right. Open. You can just turn up. Uh, we don't have a, 
okay, we don't good. have a limit of the number of people who can be on Zoom. It's not like if it was a, a class where with social distancing, there'd be only so many people we could get in. That's, that'd be the only reason it'd be a problem, just being able to physically and safely fit people in. But when we're on Zoom, anybody is always welcome to join any of the times. Okay, not a problem. Yay, I got 100%. Yay. I have a and, question. Sure. And the test will be on Connect, right? Yes, so we'll come on Zoom together like we are now. And right. then you can also on another web page, you can open up Connect and the mm -hmm. test will appear once everybody's ready to take the test. Okay. So it'll be okay. the non the homework assignment that you see on Connect. Okay. Thank you. Was there another question getting squeezed in there? Or maybe um, yeah, I have a question about the homework. I took it and I'm not too sure about some of the answers may have came up kind of strange. I double checked them. I wasn't sure if they were messed up or something like uh, a question so about I, volume. So I found two questions initially or students have found two questions which are incorrect. What was the two? One of them came up this morning. I think it was Trisha who noticed it. So kudos to her. I did take a picture of it. There's one question for uh, calculation 17.2 minus 0.152. That one is incorrect at the moment. I will manually go through and find out who had been given that question and then give them credit for that. Um, what I'll say is that once the homework closes tonight at 10 o'clock, an hour later, you can go back on after 11 o'clock or tomorrow and look at the answers to your homework assignment and see how everything broke down, okay? All and, then right, get back to, and then get back to me if you still think one of the answers has been listed wrong, okay? One other thing to mention, what, I don't, this never came up previous years, but it looks like if you get 100% on your first attempt for the homework, then the program just blocks you from taking the second attempt. It would be nice if it told you you've got 100%, you can't do any better, but it just blocks you without any explanation. So this has come up with three people in the last 48 hours. So if you are being blocked from taking your second attempt, you can assume that you have got 100% the first time round. That should have told you, and people are telling me that they are see seeing their scores. It must just flash up briefly or something, or somehow some people are missing that bit of information, okay? Any other thoughts or questions before we call it a day? A question of the day video will come up later this morning. Uh, there'll also be a video out. I'm hoping before two. Well, I will guarantee it's before two o'clock. A video for the answers to the polling questions will be up. So take a look at that. That will help you out before the taking the test itself today or tomorrow. Okay, if that's it. Yep, you are allowed to use a calculator. Um, just a simple calculator, nothing that you can look up and web pages on, please. That'd be nice. But you can use a calculator. Okay. I will talk to everybody soon. Again, text me if you need something. 618 364 5546. Bye, guys. Have a good one. You too.